Precisely. Yes. <coughs> oh, no, she would let me. <coughs> ah, sorry about that. Come on in. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Watson. Yes, indeed. Yes. Go right through. <coughs> uh, Holmes, this is Dr. Mortimer. Uh, Dr. Mortimer, this is Sherlock Holmes. Please don't get up, Mr. Holmes. I have no intention of doing so. Watson, fetch this gentleman a chair. Oh, I'd be delighted to do so. Yes, indeed. Oh, my goodness. <coughs> Why don't you take a seat, Dr. Mortimer? Sit yourself down here. <coughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. May I tell you, Mr. Holmes, how much I've admired you over the years? Well, naturally, Dr. Mortimer, but please get on with it. Ah, let me explain, first of all, that I am the executor of the Baskerville estate, valued at over a million pounds, almost all in property, a vast expanse of desolate moor. I read about Sir Charles's death in the Times. Natural causes, was it not? Well, that was for the public, but it is in my opinion that Sir Charles was murdered. Murder by supernatural means. My dear fellow, we are living in the 20th century. Are we? Well, be that as it may, local legend has it that a monstrous brute, a veritable hound of hell, has been the death of every single master of Baskerville Hall. A hound? Dr. Mortimer, just what were the circumstances of Sir Charles's death? Well, Sir Charles Baskerville was my patient for a great number of years, during which time he was completely sane. But as the years went by, he became somewhat of a recluse, rarely leaving his estate and building a huge fence around the whole of the property. He became completely and utterly obsessed with the idea that the legendary hound of the Baskervilles was going to return to destroy him. How extraordinary! I see nothing unusual in any of this. Oh, my thoughts exactly, Holmes. Oh, yes. I was called to the house in my official capacity as coroner to investigate the extraordinary circumstances in which Sir Charles' body was found. Do go on and spare no detail, however small. Get it over with. Yes, cut it short. On his face was frozen a look of such extraordinary terror that it was almost impossible to recognize him. There was no sign of physical violence on the body whatsoever, but close by were footprints. Enormous, unnatural, unworldly footprints. Let's have it. Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. Oh, does it have huge dripping jaws and... And, and great oozing eyes and enormous private parts. Enormous. Oh, God. But, but how do you know? Well, I used to have a little Pekingese like that. You know, it used to leap up on the bed and bear its fangs. And then, when I was least desperate... You call yourself, Watson. Seems rather straightforward to me. Absolutely cut and dry, didn't it? Well, gentlemen, will you be able to meet the Earl and myself at the Northumberland Hotel at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? Oh, what do you think, Holmes? Should we meet the air here? Uh, the hair here? The air here? Or the air there? There! Tomorrow at ten! Here, here! There! There! May I introduce young Sir Henry Baskerville, heir of Baskerville Hall and 2,000 acres of swamp. I can't thank you enough, Mr. Holmes, for coming here this morning. I mean, what with you being such a wonderful sleuth. You must help us, Mr. Holmes. A sinister incident occurred last night. Tell him, Sir Henry. Yes. Well, I went to bed early because, you see, I... No, not me. Him. Oh, yes. Okie dokie. I went to bed early last night because I felt a bit under the weather. A touch of dicky tummy, you know, runs in the family. <coughs> Yeah, well, anyway, I put my boots out to be shined, and when I got up in the morning, I opened the door, and would you believe it, one of them was missing. Do you think I'm going to waste my time combing the streets of London for some old boot? This is a job for an imbecile. Quite right, Holmes. Let me deal with this. <laughs> Sir Henry, uh, the boot, you allege, was stolen. What colour was it? Br brown, yes, brown. Oh, uh, brown, was it? Yes, brown. Exactly the same colour as this boot, the one we have in front of us. Well, of course, I always try to get two the same colour. It's too much of a coincidence, Holmes. I don't like the smell of this. The smell, exactly. What better way to entice a hound than to give it some personal object from which it can derive the scent of the intended victim? Yes, Sir Henry is in great 
danger. I'm sorry, gentlemen, I'm not available to take this case. Dr. Watson will handle the matter. Oh, no! Oh, no! I've never done anything on my own before. I think you have, Watson. Are you sure you won't change your mind, Mr. Holmes? I'm sorry, Dr. Mortimer. I'm very tired. I've had a lot of cases. Being the world's greatest detective is no bed of roses. <sighs> I'll leave you in good hands. Good day, gentlemen. I'll find my own way out. Yes, he probably will. Yes. This is a bitter disappointment to me. Ha. Oh. Well, now, uh, let's get down to business. Uh, there are one or two things that have been bothering me about this case. Uh, oh. Firstly, uh, this stick which you have here. Dr. Mortimer, I see by this hair that you are a dog fancier. Spaniel? Retriever? Labrador? Hound? Perhaps? No, it's a special sort of dog bred by a friend of mine on the moors. It's Mexican. They call it a chihuahua. The hairs get everywhere. <laughs> the chihuahua is a hairless beast, Dr. Mortimer. Not on the moors, Dr. Watson. Naturally, Dr. Chihuahua, Mortimer. Ah, where and at what time does he train me for Baskerville? Tomorrow, 12 o'clock, Victoria. Oh, no, you can call me John. Uh, we will recognize each other by wearing pink carnations in our lapels. Oh, I like pink. Yes, I, uh, yes, I do. <laughs>